Hello everyone and welcome to the Winecast. Though summer's officially over, that shouldn't stop us from spending a little time on that quintessentially summer wine, though it's great all year round too, rosé. Sometimes it feels like rosés are everywhere, and there aren't too many wine drinkers out there who haven't tried one. But in spite of all that, rosé isn't well understood by consumers as a style, especially in terms of its production. So with that in mind, let's have a look at how rosé is made and say a few words about what you can expect from a bottle of pink. To get a sense of rosé production, you have to know a little bit about red wine production, specifically about how red wine gets its color through a process called maceration. Except for a small group of grape varietals called tenturiers that have a red-tinted pulp underneath their red skins, most grapes have a clear pulp, and the juice from that pulp is also clear. The juice from red grapes gets its color from compounds called anthocyanins that are in the skins and that leach out when the juice and skins are in contact. To start this process, red grapes are crushed and the clear juice is placed inside a vat or tank, along with the crushed grapes. The longer this contact or maceration goes on, the more color compounds, along with flavor compounds and tannins, will be extracted from the skin and the darker and deeper in color the juice will become. Maceration usually goes on at the same time as fermentation and can, at the winemaker's discretion, last for quite a bit longer. And when maceration is complete, it's time for pressing. The combination of grape juice and crushed grapes, called must, is drained from the tank and then put into a press, and then the resulting wine can be aged and then bottled. Rosé production has a lot of overlap with this process. But the big difference and key to making a rosé is to limit the amount of time the skins and juice spend macerating. There are two methods to do this, limited skin contact followed by pressing, and a method called saunier. A third method, blending, has a very limited scope and should be considered separately from the other two. And finally, as a sort of bonus pour, we should have a look at Von Gris, a style that is at the very limits of what it means for something to be a rosé. The skin contact and pressing approach to rosé starts out exactly as a red maceration would. But after only a short time on the skins, maybe 12 to 24 hours, when the juice is only lightly colored, the grapes are pressed and the resulting juice can continue fermentation without additional skin contact. After fermentation, the resulting wine is bottled as a rosé. A pretty solid majority of the world's rosés are made this way, and using this process can be a good indication that the winemaker is serious about making a quality pink wine, especially when the wine would have fetched a higher price if it had been vinified red. Generally speaking, a producer can charge more for a red than for a rosé, and for a winemaker to dedicate an entire batch of grapes, especially of an expensive, in-demand grape like, say, Cabernet Sauvignon, to make a rosé suggests that this was done out of love for the style and not just concerns about the bottom line. A method that's a bit more bottom line oriented is saunier, though it would be wrong to assume that rosés made this way are necessarily of lower quality. For a saunier, which means bloodletting or bleeding in French, you start out with juice that's had a short maceration, again somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 to 24 hours. Then you drain or bleed some of that juice off. The juice that you bled off then finishes fermentation without skin contact and is bottled and sold as a rosé. But the remaining juice in the vat or the tank continues to macerate and draw off anthocyanins, tannins, and flavor compounds from the grape skins. And in fact, these compounds become more concentrated in this juice than they otherwise would have been because the ratio of juice to skin is now lower thanks to the saunier. When maceration is complete, the must in the tank can be pressed and the resulting wine will be an intense and concentrated red. Using this process for rosé production probably started off as an afterthought, with producers bleeding off juice and then pouring it down the drain because the only goal was to make a more concentrated red. At some point, an astute winemaker realized that he could continue to ferment the lightly colored juice he drained off and sell it rather than dump it. Economically, this was a great move because the resulting rosé could be produced and sold quickly, generating a positive cash flow while the big, bold red was aging. Now, while it's true that this method of rosé production can be congenial to producers thinking about how to maximize revenue, it bears repeating that doing a saunier isn't an automatic indicator of poor quality. And I, for one, have had a number of fantastic pinks made this way. As with all wine, 
What it all comes down to is doing some research, finding a reliable quality producer, and if you're fortunate, getting to taste a little before you buy. Almost all of the world's rosé is made via the two methods I just described. But if you ask folks who don't have a background in wine production where rosés come from, you'd be surprised how often you'll hear that they must be a blend of red and white wines. I mean, red and white equals pink, right? Yeah, not so much. Just about the only place that happens actually is at parties when someone pours some white into your glass but you haven't finished all of your red yet, and then you drink it anyway. Hey, no shame, we've all been there. But that's pretty much the only place that's going to happen because it's either straight up illegal like it is in France, or just not the done thing in most of the world's wine regions. You may find an example of it here or there, or in countries, especially in the New World where wine production is relatively unregulated, but for still wines anyway, this would only be a tiny fraction of how rosés would be produced. It's a different story for sparkling wines though, and in Champagne and other sparkling wine producing areas, a little bit of red wine can be added to the dosage or topping off liquid before the final corking to give the sparkler a pink hue. There are wine regions, by the way, like Tavelle in France, where rosés are produced from both red and white grapes, but the practice here is to crush the grapes together and to co-ferment the juice into a single rosé rather than to blend finished wines. As a bit of a bonus pour, let's talk for just a minute about Von Gris or gray wine. Von Gris is essentially a way of making a white wine from red grapes by allowing virtually no time for skin contact or maceration. The juice is either very lightly pressed or is free-run juice that was released by the weight of the grapes in the upper parts of the bin or vat that they're in, pressing down on the grapes in the lower part of the vat. Both of these procedures make for minimal color extraction from the skins, but depending on the particular varietal or how deeply pigmented it is, the wine may have a slight tint to it. Sometimes this tint will go by the name Oi de Perdrix, or Eye of the Partridge, a term that's specific to a wine produced in this style from Pinot Noir in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. This technique is also used in Champagne where two red grapes, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier, are permitted in the blends. A Champagne made entirely from either or both of these two red grapes will be identified as a Blanc de Noir, or a white from black, that is, a white wine from black or red grapes. Production took up a fair amount of our time, but we should say something about what you're likely to find in that bottle of rosé that you're looking to buy. The color of a rosé depends on two things, the varietal it's made from and the length of time that the juice and skins are in contact before pressing or bleeding off. You'll see a whole spectrum of color from ruby red, as in the grapefruit, to salmon to onion skin or pelure d'oignon, as the French like to call it, down to a light pinkish orange that reminds me of the color of children's aspirin. Despite what you might assume, though, there's not a strong correlation between color and intensity of flavor or aroma, and I've sampled very dark rosés that didn't have all that much going on, and pale, pale, pale examples that were intensely aromatic and flavorful. Be on your guard, though, for rosés that have a bright orange or intense copper color to them. This can be a sign of oxidation and might mean that the wine was exposed to too much oxygen during production, which won't do it any favors from a flavor or aroma standpoint. Rosés in a given wine region tend to be made from the same grapes that are used to make reds in that region, but the flavors in a rosé won't just be a lighter version of the flavors in a corresponding red wine. Rosés tend to have several flavors and aromas, like grapefruit, resin, and green or sometimes tropical notes, that set them apart from reds based on compounds called thiols. Thiols are volatile, though, and have to be managed carefully during production, and it will also just fade over time. So, rosés generally don't make great candidates for aging, and a good rule of thumb is not to drink a rosé that's more than a year old. In other words, if it's 2016, don't drink anything older than a 2015. There are exceptions to this rule, most notably rosés made in Tavel in the Southern Rhone and Bandol in Provence, which can last and improve for several years. More and more producers throughout the world are experimenting with techniques to allow rosés to age effectively, so do some research and see what you can come up with if you want to try a pink with a little bit of age on it. Finally, a lot of rosés are known for being sweet, sometimes very sweet as in the case of White Zinfandel. 
But pink wines can be and are made to all levels of sweetness, with most Old World or premium New World styles being very dry. If your experience with dry rosés is limited, I definitely encourage you to sample some sooner rather than later. Thanks for joining me for another winecast. I'm not including a list of recommended regions to try rosés from, because rosé is made just about everywhere and singling out a few regions would be a little bit like trying to recommend just a couple of regions to try red wine in. So maybe a good strategy might be to check out what's available in your area, either produced locally or just what you can find in stores, do some research to separate the good from the bad, and then just jump in. Rosés tend to be good bargains, so you shouldn't feel like you have to break the bank to experiment. And, despite what you may hear, you can drink rosé any time of the year and for any occasion. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this cast and haven't already. And always enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.